Hello and welcome to HPA Global Insights, where we'll be interviewing experts from the dietary supplement, nutritional ingredient, and overall natural health food industry. Please like, subscribe, turn on that little notification bell, and comment below. Now on with the show. Hi, welcome to the show today. Today we're going to talk about the Japanese dietary supplement market, and we have our friend here, Hisaki Kato. Uh, his friends call him Aki because it's easier to pronounce. So how are you? Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me for the interview. And uh, I'm very happy to share my knowledge with you guys. Excellent. So you're, you're based in Japan, just outside of uh, Tokyo, correct? Correct. About 40 kilometers south to to from Tokyo. Okay. And um, you've been in the industry quite a long time, mostly working for large companies um, in, in the Japanese region, life sciences, supplements, food ingredients, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Mainly uh, dealt with vitamins and uh, some functional ingredients. Okay. And now you're running, you're the CEO of SmoothLink in Japan, which helps international companies do business in Japan, life science companies, as well as Japanese companies that are looking to go abroad overseas. Right, correct. So you are the right person to have a discussion with about Japan's dietary supplement market. I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, let's just, every country is different. So let's, let's just talk about the, the official name. You know, what, are, what, what does Japan officially call dietary supplements in English? Okay. Uh, dietary supplement is a truly a English words. So we call such products shaped in tablets, capsule, and others are sub just supplements. But in broad sense, those things good for your health is also called health foods. So supplement is a one, one type of health foods here in Japan. Okay, so it's a, so we could say like the overall health product industry would include a lot more things other than just vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Probiotics and some functional ingredients extracted from plants, or maybe from uh, animal tissues, things, everything. Okay. So in comparison, I would say, I guess then in, in the U.S. we have the VMS or vitamin mineral supplements. And then on top of that, we have the overall dietary supplement category that would cover what you just mentioned, like botanical extracts and fish oil and, mm -hmm. and probiotics and sports nutrition type products, things like that. Okay, so, so. Supplement is just coming from the shape of the products. Okay. Okay. So, and then what, in, in terms of the government agency, what what is the what is the agency that oversees supplements that you know if you're entering the market you're definitely going to have to be aware of this agency and probably have to deal with them at some level so what what is that agency actually uh the ministry of health and labor okay we call them uh in short health labor and welfare they are totally responsible for food and drugs. And also, in the health food, it is le legally approved to state health claim. We call them food with health claims. Okay. These products are managed by another agency called the Consumer Affairs Agency. Okay. So like a Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, in short, we call MHLW, and the Consumer Affairs Agency is CAA. Okay. 
So maybe it, that would be a, a comparison to maybe like here in the U.S. We have the U.S. FDA, yeah. which would be like the 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 Ministry of Health, and then mm -hmm. then we have the FTC, which overlooks all the advertising and claims and things like that. So that it seems like a fair fair comparison, I guess. Well, some of the system we learn and the copy and the paste from your country. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> so with that note, that's an interesting kind of uh, segue off here. So maybe, I mean, this is, uh, could be a very long answer, but let's try and keep it short. What is the basic history of supplements or, or health products in Japan? Like when, when did health products start to become available? You know, some mm -hmm. vitamins or calcium or these type of things and start to become popular in Japan? Okay, uh, you know, uh, the health food has been in the market for a long time, but uh, most of them are like uh, just food or something like uh, fresh things or extract, extract from plants. But uh, late 80s, you know, the uh, very bestseller book called the, the Vitamin Bible? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, Japanese version was also uh, issued late eighties. Then in Japan there was a so-called vitamin boom. <laughs> okay. People start taking uh, like more vitamins, minerals, and so on, because uh, at that time vitamins are very close to the pharmaceutical thing. And uh, late nineties. We have received some political pressure from the United States to deregulate the shape of the health food. So the typical tablet shape, uh, soft gel thing, hard gel thing, these are the available. That also pushed the popularity of supplement in Japan. Mm. So about 30 years ago, supplements became, gained a position in the health food market. Yeah, I don't know. I think it depends how you categorize it, but I think Japan is, is uh, way up there in terms of market size compared to a lot of other countries. You think so? Yeah, I think. Well, I, I know when, when, you know, dealing with China, I mean, U.S. is kind of the number one market in the world and then um, China is around number two and then Japan was always coming in around number three but you know mm -hmm. population comparison I mean it's just percentage wise it's a very big market and there's a lot of a lot of Japanese products go to to China market as well very mm -hmm. popular um, all right so let's get back on the regulatory side of things and I um, we talked a little early and you, you have a, um, a presentation to share that kind of goes over some of the things that we just talked about, but then, then some more things too. So why don't we go ahead and, and uh, put that up and go through that um, presentation. Okay. All right. Can you see? Yep, there you go. I can see it. Okay, okay helpful. Uh so like, uh, let me start with what health foods are in Japan. Because uh, anything ingested by orally is defined either food or drugs in Japan by law. The food, health food is something like uh, this green box. This is a health-oriented food. Mm -hmm. Just a general foods containing some ingredients such as like a high dose of vitamin C in the soft drinks or yogurt containing probiotics, but they don't claim, make any health claims. We call health-oriented foods. Okay. However, the next three blue to purple boxes. These are the food with so-called food with health claims. 
you can put some health claim on the pr products. This is the first health food with a health claim called food for specified health use called FOSH. And uh, this started about 1991. And okay. uh, this one, NFFC, food with nutrient function claim, started about 10 years later. But this is uh, only limited for 13 vitamins, six minerals, and omega-3. What is booming right now is this one. Started 2015 with mm -hmm. FFC, food with a function claim. You don't have to deal with the government. You can put some health claim under your own responsibility. And uh, this was about 255 billion, but we are expecting to hit over 300 million this year. It's very booming. So the, four, let me just ask a question there quickly. Um, so it says here on that, that, that last box you just mentioned is 255 billion. Is that, mm -hmm. it, in, in what currency is that? Uh, it's a JPY, Japanese yen. Okay. okay. About 103 to 4 yen is one dollar. Okay. So like, uh, if I go to the next slide, maybe I can uh, come back to this one again with a little more detail. Sure. See, uh, FFC is a uh, kind of copy-paste system from your policy called DSHA? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this was started about five, six years ago at the part of uh, Prime Minister at that time, Mr. Abe's policy to reboot the economy. Okay. So this is a health food breakdown by market size. About 56% of the product are no health claim. But the other side, 44%, those three, Porsche, FNFC, FFC, stands for like 44% of the total market size of 2,280 billion Japanese yen. Thanks to the FFC, it's very rapidly growing and uh, total estimated market size of about 6% growth year on year. Oh, okay. That's on the other side, it's a little bit shrinking, but only a minus 0.2%. But uh, interesting is uh, both sides of uh, food, health food, over 50% has shape, a uh, dosage form of tablets, capsule, so-called supplements. So supplements really gain the loot in Japanese market. Uh, the other so like a looks like a general food or maybe even fresh fruits. So it, it not quickly understand what they are, but uh, we have two types of health food. One is you cannot make any health claim. Second one, you can put some health claim. But a force is the uh, only government approved. The other two are, as long as you can meet some guideline or standard, you can put some already designated health claim for F NFC. And FFC, you only notify to the CAA, Consumer Affairs Agency, that you want to launch this product 
prior to the six, at least six days prior to the launch. So this is a structure of health food in Japan. Okay. You want to continue? Yeah, sure. I think you have a few more slides. We just we can just go through those and then okay. go back to some questions if we have. So this is a pros and cons of health food. Health oriented food as general food, the the other side, the left side of the health food. Any product form is possible. And uh, there are so many contracted commissioned manufacturer to make some product for you. But uh, you have, you cannot make any health claim. So how to promote your product is a big challenge because you have to deal with so many different laws and standards. And the FNFC, like I said, 13 vitamins, six minerals, omega-3. So choice is limited, but uh, easy to launch product as long as you are in line with uh, designated or already set the standard level of the each ingredient. And of course, this is a very uh, expensive challenge because it requires many years and a huge cost. But uh, you can put some uh, cert certified mark by government. Okay. So it to identify and uh, gives you the position. And the FNC rapidly growing. It's very easy to apply because you only notify to the agency that you want to launch this product. Here is a information for the safety, quality, and evidences of the efficacy. You can do it by systematic review or clinical trial. Mm -hmm. for clinical trial is also required for the force system as well. Okay. So, See, the supplements or health foods are so popular in Japan. You know, this, this is familiar for you, uh, Nature Made. Sure. Nature Made is owned by a Japanese company. Yes. And they have, uh, they located in California, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, one of the leading uh, health food manufacturer, supplement manufacturer in Japan their products, same for the, So like uh, if you go to drug store or drug chain stores, you can find easily where you can find the health food supplements are because they provide quite huge space for those products. Let's, let's go back one slide to the pros and cons there. Mm -hmm. um, so the last one there, the FFC, that one is the one that is more like, um, a little bit more similar to the US market, whereas mm -hmm. the, the manufacturer has to be responsible for following the guidelines and all that. So the one above that where, where you're getting an actual mark from the government, and it says, you know, uh, requires years and costs. So let's, I think that's an important part of you know, knowing how, how many years on average does that take up? You know, every product is I'm sure different depending on the ingredients and its claim okay. and all that. But if we can get like an average time frame and okay. how much it typically costs uh, to go through okay. that process. It's only, uh, you know, depend on the cases, but uh, normally FNFC, almost nothing as long as the content level, level of content meets the guideline. For example, iron, as long as your iron content is 2.04 to 10 milligram, you can say this is a FNFC. 
but there is no mark or uh, you have to state like uh, this is not uh, reviewed by government. Sure. And uh, Fosh, Fosh is the uh, started 1991, the first system, but uh, this requires two to five years and the cost maybe 20 to 150 million Japanese yen. So that means small, medium sized company have a high hurdle to apply force. And uh, most of the cost coming from the cl conducting clinical trials. But in the end, there are now there are about over 1,000 items are saying that the false products now these days. And the FFC, FFC is about 60 to 180 days. By, according to the explanation by the agency, you have to notify to the agency prior to six day, 60 days prior to the launch. But uh, they are very busy to review the document received. So it's getting a bit of a delay. And the cost is about seven to 15 million yen. So how much? Seven to 15, one five. Mm -hmm. Million. Of course, you know, the the gap, the difference of eight million is, you want to conduct clinical trials or not? This accept like uh, to show the efficacy of the ingredients or product. You can do like I said, systematic review, or with clinical trials. It's up to you. Okay. But uh, why this is growing and the force is not so, it's kind of flat or a little bit declining is that many companies, some companies are doing some uh, research or conducting clinical trials to get the force approval, have switched to the, their direction to FFC much easier. Okay. Now, from the from the consumer perspective, I mean, it's it would be easy to assume that having the government mark on your label would be more beneficial. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but is that the case? Do consumers understand the mark from the government and you know FFC in these different categories, or do they just look at them like they're just all health food, and I just want to buy the the one I trust or the lower cost price one or something like that? Like drug stores, sure. they have identified this, for example, this is a force product and uh, this is a FFC, so easy to distinguish the consumer. But the uh, problem is that they don't know exactly what are they. A mm. little bit uh, lack of the knowledge. Sure. Because they sure. think these products are the same as a pharmaceuticals. Yeah, that seems that's um, when I when I landed in China back in two thousand five for the first time. That's that's what we ran into. Um, a lot of people mm -hmm. would, especially older people, they would just think that that dietary supplements were like drugs because they came in a pill. And that's what drugs are, pills. So there's a misconception there, and it still to this day still has that problem. Right. And the authorities uh, keep saying to the consumers that uh, these products are designed for health pe healthy people, not for sick people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you know, the shapes or how do you call it, the design maybe resembles to the pharmaceutical products, many sure. of them are. Sure. So that's sure. one of the challenge, how to educate the consumers. Yeah, that is a big, big challenge. Um, mm -hmm. My, my um, 
my friends in China, a lot of them, their parents that are older will, will take some health products, but they will only take it until the bottle's gone and they'll stop because they think if they keep taking it, there's probably some side effect uh, because mm -hmm. they, they have it in their mind that, that these are akin or similar to drugs and have some right. kind of, um, have a good effect and also have maybe some negative effect. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it seems education across many countries is, is, in, is in need. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, let's go back to that slide where you have the pictures of the stores there and talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of retail and where people buy these. So this picture, is this all the same store or is this different? Uh, about about uh, four or five stores. Oh, okay. And are and, these, uh, so these are pharmacies? Uh, pharmacies and the drug stores. Okay, so what would be the difference between a pharmacy and a drug store? A pharmacy is the, uh, they can, they can receive a prescription from okay. a patient and give some uh, appropriate pharmaceutical product along with the doctor's recommendation. Okay. But the drugstore, they, they sell almost everything. Sometimes they sell confectionery or whatever, soft drinks. Okay. But uh, they also sell some OTC products. So the, in, in your definition, then the drugstore is more like uh, packaged goods. So everything is packaged and ready to be sold to consumers. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because I just asked because here in the U.S., drugstore and pharmacy kind of go hand in hand. We use those terms uh, basically the same. If you say drugstore, pharmacy, it's basically the same, like a CVS or Rite Aid or Walgreens, those type of places. Oh yeah, that's which 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 are similar to this. I mean, it looks like you know when you go into a, a CVS or Walgreens, you have supplements, you have candy and cookies and and Christmas <laughs> gifts and you know beauty products and shampoo and soap mm -hmm. and you know got all kinds of stuff. Um, but um, are there any um, specialty health food stores in Japan that just like a GNC or? You know, like these type of, they just sell supplements and that's it? Well, some Japanese manufacturer has own stores. Okay. And uh, sometimes they open the store outside of Japan. But sure. it's only a few. Okay. And it's, and where do most people are buying supplements? Are they going to the store and buying them or are they, you know, like China or some of other, you know, other Asian countries, they shopping online and mm -hmm. ordering them through e-commerce or, you know, what's kind of a popular way to get supplements? Yep. I think the best se selling channel is the uh, correspondent sales, including online, regular mail or catalog shoppings. 40, over 41% of the consumer are buying from this channel. And what, what, was and, that, uh, what was that channel again called, you said? Correspondence sales. Oh, correspondence sales, okay. Online regular mail and the catalog shopping. However, the 45% of this channel is covered by internet online. Okay. So this is a very big tool. And the uh, second is uh, door to door sales or MLM, multi-level marketing. Okay. This is about 32%. And uh, dr from drug store uh, clinics, about 20%. And the retail store covers the rest, like a food or supermarket or something, convenience store. So online shopping is very popular now. For foreign companies that enter the market, are they 
are they are they doing their own registrations or dealing with the government or is it like they they you know typically hire a consultant or someone to actually help them through that process i want to share my experience when i try to help us dietary supplement company mm -hmm. and uh, i went through over 100 of their product and uh, maybe over 80 percent of their product are not ideal for japan because of the the difference in uh, usage of ingredients mm -hmm. and we have another challenge called uh, there's some uh, how do you call it ingredients is okay for pharmaceuticals if you don't claim any efficacy you can use for food either we have such a list so when for example like uh, when i receive some ingredient list from uh, my client i have to check which one is okay or which one is not okay sure. and after my final review is done, I have to go to quarantine station, which belongs to MHLW. They do some uh, more severe investigation. Okay. All right. And then I have to give them a production flow. That when everything is okay, then we go to customs office to get uh, approval for import. Okay. So, uh, it, this is a kind of pain in the procedure. Yes, because like... uh, sometimes, you know, the book doesn't tell you exactly about your ingredients. So when we have some such kind of an issue, we have to visit a pharmaceutical department for the local government to verify this is okay or not. Okay. So this procedure takes a really long time. Yeah, so it seems that most foreign companies or international companies won't, won't be able to do that by themselves. So uh, in that case, like, you know, if your main product really want to sell in Japan, you have to reformulate. Sure. Will you do that or not? It's a kind of a big decision required. So as long as I know, there is no foreign companies selling their product directly to Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, only MLM company like Amway or New Skin, this kind of MLM companies have their subsidiaries in Japan sure. and selling sure. products. Yeah, I think that's one of the problems um, for the U.S. market is that the market is so um, advanced and so open that mm -hmm. it's if you go to any other country, typically you're going to have problems with your formula because it includes ingredients that are not allowed in that country or the dosage or potency is too high. Um, I, you know, we see that the same thing when we're helping companies with China is that most most of the products coming out of the U.S. would not qualify for approval by the Chinese government because of the ingredients yeah. or the potency. So that's why most of them go through that cross-border e-commerce mm -hmm. where they don't have to do any of that. Same um, here. Yeah. So that's a uh, that's a big. You know, most of the direct sale companies or MLM companies they they try to create products that are universally accepted. So they don't have to have a product for every country. They kind of try to use a uniform and they also don't have a lot of products. Typically they usually have 10 products, you know, or 20 um, different products and that's it compared to, you know, some companies that have 300 to, you know, 3000 different products. It's uh, mm -hmm. that's a kind of crazy. Yes, um, I'm happy to know you have the same experience like I have. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, uh, that's, that's what happens when you go live in another country, yeah. yeah. 
many young people, they buy products. I'm, I'm talking about the foreign products through, how do you call it, a private import mm -hmm. or sure. online like Amazon. Because, uh, for example, your, your dietary supplement, the dosage con level is much higher than Japanese level. Or some product uh, using uh, ingredients which you cannot obtain in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, the government is saying that uh, be careful with the private import because it might ha have some negative effect for your health. Sure. I think a lot of countries are dealing with that now. I mean, it's, you know, one side, the, go the government basically, most governments treat it like this. For example, a, a Japanese citizen gets on an airplane, flies to America and, and buys some health products from a health food store and then brings them back to Japan in their luggage and uses them. Um, they're, they're free to do that. I mean, they bought them. Um, I think the only thing they would have to legally do is pay, the, pay a tax you know, to enter um, mm. Japan, uh, which most people don't do that. Um, but because they have these independent sellers um, in, in, you know, China has many of these folks, uh, Chinese people living in Australia and Canada and America and Europe and sending products directly to people's houses. Um, for the uh, most part, I think it's, um, you know, relatively safe. But then again, you know, you really can't be 100% sure who you're buying this from sometimes. So it's, uh, it can be kind of risky. If I go to abroad, I buy melatonin because melatonin is not approved in Japan. <laughs> Which one? Melatonin to give you a good sleep. Oh, is that, okay. Melatonin, that's not approved. No. That's interesting. <laughs> that, that, you know, China is a very restrictive market for supplements, but even melatonin is approved. That's approved in China. So that's, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that that's not approved in, in Japan. Yeah, this is considered as a drug in Japan. So you can get melatonin in Japan, it's just you would need a prescription for it? I don't think this is a substance by prescription. prescription. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because I never asked doctors for melatonin in Japan. <laughs> so, but in the, in the pharmacy or the drugstore, you can't, you can't, there's no melatonin? No. Oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> well, we learn something every day. Um, all right, well, let's wrap this up. It's, it's, uh, we're 40 minutes into this video and um, mm -hmm. we can certainly make some other ones. I think there's a good overview of the basics of, of the regulatory system and and a little bit of the consumer side and retail. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Oh, my pleasure. Very, very, very nice. Um, I'll put, again, I'll put that slide up um, at the end for your contact information. If people wanna contact you, um, they can feel free to do that. Okay, thank you very much for your kindness. Yes, thank you. and. Uh, I hope all goes well there. I know that there's some, you know, with the COVID-19, there's some more cases popping up around the area in Japan and uh, here in the U.S. There's a lot. So I think we're all hoping by the end of the spring, beginning of summer, we'll, we'll see a brighter day, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, take care. Talk yeah, to you soon. Thank you very much again. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to HPA Global Insights. Please like, subscribe, and share with your colleagues. Any questions or suggestions, email us at info at uschinahpa.org. This channel is operated by US China Health Products Association, which is a nonprofit organization. Please consider joining the association and supporting its global endeavors. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, take care.